Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, if you're enjoying our legal education content, I hope today will be the day that I earn your subscription. For today's case, we're dealing with COVID restrictions in California, specifically as it relates to schools. This is the case of Matthew Brock versus Gavin Newsom. In this case, Gavin Newsom shut down schools, both public and private schools, and two groups of parents sue a group of parents who had sent their kids to public schools and a group of parents who sent their kids to private schools. And in this decision, the Court of Appeals decides that the public school parents do not have a case, but the private school parents do have a case because of different levels of scrutiny. So we're going to learn a little bit about the COVID restrictions and what happened as we analyze this case. Let's get started with this. This case involves a challenge to various orders that California has issued concerning the operation of schools and other facilities during COVID. Among the plaintiffs are 10 parents of current California public school students and also five parents of private school students who seek to send their children to private school for in-person instruction. The plaintiffs also allege that California's school closure mandate violates equal protection clause by arbitrarily treating plaintiff's children and other minors attending public and private schools differently from those in nearby school districts, from those in childcare, and from those attending summer camps, even though all such children and their families are similarly situated. Okay, so we understand the basic premise of the case. We understand that we have public school parents and private school parents saying they want to send their kids for in-person instruction. And they say that the way that California has been restricting schools is inconsistent with the way they've been restricting other activities. So to understand if that's true, we need to understand a little bit about how California has undergone its COVID mandates. So let's go through a brief history discussing how California has regulated around COVID. As cases of COVID began to rise in early 2020, government officials across the country began to issue orders seeking to control the spread of the virus. In March the 22nd of 2020, the California State Public Health Officer issued a list of designated essential workers who were allowed, with government's permission, to leave their homes to support critical infrastructure. So if you are one of the chosen, you can leave your home. That list expressly included workers teaching in public and private schools, but only related to distance learning. So yes, if you are one of the chosen few, if you are one of the if you are one of the honored, if you are one of the privileged, you can leave your house because you're essential. Because the virus doesn't spread around essential workers and all those non-essential people, they can just stay in their house and be locked down forever. As for K for 12, well, only for the distance learning, not in person. Okay. In a follow-on order, the state's public health officer stated that they would progressively designate sectors, businesses, establishment activities that may open with certain modifications. The order further provided that to the extent that such sectors are reopened, Californians may leave their homes to work at, patronize, or other engage with these business or activities, provided that at all times they must practice physical distancing, minimize their time outside the home, and wash their hands frequently. So if you don't have business at any of these places, you don't get to leave. The order reinstated that apart from any such designated exceptions, the March 19th stay-at-home order otherwise would remain in full effect. Under the framework criteria, a school generally could reopen for in-person instruction only if the school's local health jurisdiction had not been on the county monitoring list for the preceding 14 days. If the local health jurisdiction was on the county monitoring list over that 14-day period, then the school was required to conduct distance learning only. After consultation, A local health officer could grant a waiver from these criteria, but only in the case of elementary schools, and only if the relevant school official requested it. As the health department later explained, the waiver policy was justified due to the low risk of child-to-child or child-to-adult transmission in children under 12. So California actually acknowledges that children are not particularly susceptible to the disease. Whoa! California actually acknowledging science on this one. Okay and a particularly low risk of infection and serious illness in children. So yeah, surprisingly enough, California is like, hey, you know, this disease doesn't really spread child to child or child to adult. Not really risk of that, uh, you know, in in the evidence. So, you know, maybe if you ask nicely, 
will allow the elementary schools, the elementary schools to reopen because there's no reason there, but only if you ask really, really nicely. So California is willing to acknowledge the science, but only up to a point. You know, the narrative must remain in place. Let's read more. Later that same month, the health department issued guidance allowing a specified subset of children and youth to meet in controlled, supervised, and indoor environments, but only in small cohorts of no more than 14 children and with no more than two supervising adults. Such cohorts could meet at school even if the school was authorized not to authorize to conduct in-person instruction. So even though the schools were not authorized to conduct in-person instruction, these cohorts could meet at the school, not for school purposes, mind you, because that would be in-person instruction, but they can meet there, just not for school, and only 14 at a time, and only two supervising adults. How arbitrary. On June the 11th of 2021, the governor issued an executive order, which formally revoked the executive orders from before. As a result, all restrictions on business and activities deriving from the framework, including all aspects of the blueprint for a safer economy, were rescinded. But the new order expressly preserves the state public health officer's authority to issue COVID-related directives. So the governor re released their executive order, but said the state authority, the state health authority could still issue executive orders. And notably, the order preserved, for some reason specifically preserved, the current COVID-19 public health guidance for K-12 through schools in California the current COVID public health guidance for child care programs and providers, and portions of the current K-12 through school guidance that made explicitly applicable to day camps and other supervised youth activities. So even as late of June of this year, June of this year, when the governor said, well, I'm finally going to release everyone from these COVID restrictions, not so much with the K-12 through schools. They still are held bound. We can't let the children meet in person for some reason. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's great. Governor, you rock on the declarations submitted by the public school plants assert their children have been harmed by distance learning. Maybe distance learning and in-person learning is not quite the same. For example, Matthew Brock described the academic and social impacts on his two children. He further asserts the school district had taken steps to be able to safely reopen schools, but they're not allowed to reopen. These steps included purchasing personal protective equipment, hand washing stations, and individual water filling stations, as well as implementing mitigation strategies, for example, staggered arrival times and a lunch time grab and go model and mask requirements. So the parent notes, hey, look, wait a second. We've implemented all these guidelines. You know, we, we have the masking, we have the social distancing, we have all the sanitation, we have staggered arrival times, we have grab and go lunch so people don't have to congregate. We have all these things and still you won't let us meet in person, even though all other businesses are open. What's the deal? What's it? Why are you doing this government? Okay. So now that we understand a little bit about the legal background of how all this came to be with the various orders and the various initiatives and the schools being held out separately for some reason, now we have to discuss the law. What is the law when it comes to restrictions, in this case, particularly of two sets of categories, public K through 12 schools and private K through 12 schools. What are the relevant legal guidelines? Okay, let's discuss that. The due process clause of the 14th amendment provides that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The Supreme Court has interpreted this guarantee to include a substantive component because they nuked the privileges or immunities clause in the slaughterhouse cases. So they had to come up with this. So it forbids the government to infringe certain fundamental liberty interests at all, no matter the process that's provided, unless the infringement is narrowly tailored to serve a compelling state interest, which is to say strict scrutiny. So some, some things are so fundamental, they can't be deprived of you with due process of law, even though that's not what the text says, but you know, slaughterhouse cases. So let's press on. The court has noted that education is not among the rights afforded explicit protection under the federal constitution and concluded that there's no basis for saying it's implicitly protected. So when you're trying to look for rights, right, one of the places you might look to is the federal constitution. And does the federal constitution have anything to say about education? No, not really. 
nor would you really expect it to, because at the time the federal constitution was written, right? The federal government was supposed to be a very limited thing, not as limited as the Articles of Confederation, but still limited with enumerated powers. And all other things were reserved to the states. In fact, you had an amendment that said explicitly that just in case it wasn't clear. So education is not a right guaranteed by the federal government, nor would our founder thought, founding fathers even have thought to include it, because that would be insane. Education was provided for by the states, and it wasn't even a right for most of history. It was just something that was provided because they thought it was good, but it's not a right to education. So yeah, of course it's not in the federal constitution. It wouldn't make sense because the federal government doesn't regulate education. And they wouldn't regulate education until they came up with the Department of Education in, what, 81 or something? So, yeah, this was the province of the states. So, of course, it's not in the federal constitution. Subsequent Supreme Court decisions have reaffirmed public education is not a right guaranteed to individuals. And they note that we, this court, has also likewise declined to recognize the existence of a federal right of education. Yeah, there's no right fundamentally to education. Yeah. Thus, the public school plans have failed to show they've been deprived of a fundamental right that's recognized by the Supreme Court. So consequently, in reviewing their substantive due process challenge, we ask only whether there is a rational relationship between the government objective and the government action. So rational basis review, right? This is not a, this is not a right that's established by the federal constitution, right? This is not a right established by the federal constitution. You're asking a federal court. So, no. So, therefore, rational basis review. So, very low standard. It's pretty easy for the government to clear it. Sometimes they fail. Sometimes they fail rational basis review, but not very often. All you need to find is there a legitimate government motivation. And are they doing it through a government legitimate methodology? Right? There's some motivations that are not legitimate. There's some methods that are not legitimate wholesale. But as long as they have a one that's okay and they do it through an okay means, you're there. And so can you get there for public schools? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, co you know, COVID is bad. If we restrict the, we restrict people meeting, you know, the COVID will spread less. So under rational basis review, really, really super easy. So that's the public school kids. They're out of luck. But how about the private school kids? Do they have a different picture? Are they in a different constitutional category? Well, let's read more and find out. As we have previously observed, the Supreme Court has long held the right of parents to make decisions concerning the care, custody, and control of their children is a fundamental liberty interest protected by due process. And this right includes the right of parents to be free from state interference with the choices of the educational forum itself. So one of the rights that is fundamental is the right of parents to parent their children. Now, there are, of course, limits, right? We can have all kinds of regulations preventing child abuse. We can child neglect. You know, we can have, you know, we can have all kinds of things that protect children. Children, after all, are protected by the Constitution, too, as are their parents. But parents have, a, have the first instance, let's say. They have the first instance. And then, you know, the child might have rights that supersede that in some situations, particularly if they're being neglected, particularly if they're being abused, particularly if they're being maltreated in some way, right? But the government, but the, but the parents have that fundamental interest in the first instance. And so, and that choice also extends to what kind of education their, their kids can get, right? There was a time when a, when a, when a state tried to make all parents send their kids to public school and the court said, no. You can't do that. You know, parents, you, you can make them get an education. You can force them to get an education. But how they go about getting that education, you can't make them go to state schools to do it. If they want to go to private schools or they want to homeschool, that's fine. You know, you can make sure, because, you know, making sure they get an education is protecting the rights of the child, ultimately, right? To make sure that they have a baseline to move forward. So that's one of those things where the parent, right, doesn't extend beyond that, right? We want to ensure the child gets some basic education, you know, notwithstanding you. But if you want to do it yourself, if you can, and you meet our requirements, Supreme Court says that's fine. Okay. So you can pick between a public school, a private school, or homeschool. That's an option. 
Thus, even as the court has always been reluctant to expand the concepts of substantive due process, it's repeatedly reaffirmed the right of a fundamental right to direct the education and upbringing of one's children. So yeah, this is this is one of those natural rights. It's one of those it's one of those Ninth Amendment rights that we didn't have to explicitly state, right? The the ability of parent to raise child is kind of important. Precedent further confirms the common sense notion: the right includes the right to include traditional in person instruction at private schools. So in a prior case, we've described the right of parents to raise their children as the right of parents to be free from state interference with the choice of the educational form. It's hard to imagine a more direct interference with the choice of form than a prohibition upon in-person instruction in the chosen form. So because parents have a fundamental right to choose how their kids will be taught, and one of the things they get to choose is the form, so if a parent wants in-person instruction, interfering with that is interfering with a fundamental right. So you make that choice. You know, and if the private school wants to continue operating privately, then you're interfering with a, with a fundamental right. So that's different than the public school picture. To satisfy strict scrutiny, California must show its infringement of private school plaintiff's right is narrowly tailored to advance a compelling interest. The only question, therefore, is whether the state has shown its broad prohibition of in-person education satisfies this narrow tailoring requirement. It has not. In Diocese of Brooklyn, the Supreme Court held that attendance caps of 10 and 25 people at indoor religious services in areas that were classified as having a high prevalence of COVID were not narrowly tailored, and because in that case it had nothing to do with the occupancy size of the church or the, uh, or the synagogue. It was just 10 and 25, and, it was, it was, and the reason it changed was depending on when, when, when the restriction was enforced. So they went from 10 to 25, right? But it was that number, no matter how big the church was. And so the Supreme Court said, well, that's not narrowly tailored. It's not like 10% of typical occupancy. It's 10 people, regardless of how big you are. It doesn't make sense. As the court explained, such caps were more restrictive than any COVID-related regulation the court had upheld. Yeah, and this 10 and 25 number was also not what was being used in non-churches and non-synagogues. In non-churches and non-synagogues, it was like an occupancy number, like 25% of capacity. For churches, for some reason, a fixed number. Yeah, they were much tighter than those adopted by many jurisdictions hard hit by the pandemic and were far more severe than has been shown to be required to prevent the spread of the virus at the relevant facilities. The same points apply here. By prohibiting in-person instruction at the relevant schools, California effectively imposed an attendance cap of zero which is much more restrictive than the numerical cap struck down by the Supreme Court for religious services in Diocese of Brooklyn. That alone confirms California's prohibition on in-person instruction is not narrowly tailored. So, yeah, because the right of a parent to choose the form for their child's education is a fundamental right, it requires strict scrutiny, right? Now, if you choose the public schools, right, you have no you have no right to a public school education, nor for that matter, do you have any right to a private school education as such, or any right to a, um, you know, school, schooling at home as such, right? It's that you have the right to choose one of those things. And then that choice comes with collateral issues. So if the state wants to sh close down the state schools, well, you've chosen the state and the state says no. And so, well, okay, that's the choice you made. But if you choose, you know, in-person instruction and in school, or apologize, in your own home, at home school, or if you choose a, choose private schools, you know, then that's a totally different thing. So that would be that would be fine. So you know, all good. Moreover, plans presented undisputed evidence that California's broad and lengthy closure of schools was more severe than what many other jurisdictions have done, thereby further negating any suggestion that California adopted the least restrictive means of accomplishing its compelling interest. California's only response to this evidence was to fall back on two relatively brief explanations from a Department of Public Health official and a doctor who did not deny the indisputable age differential in COVID, but were nonetheless defending the broad school closure brands on the grounds that given the mechanism of COVID transmission, it's possible that the school setting, as other settings, asymptomatic transmission may occur. It, it, yeah. It's, it's possible. I, I suppose lots of things are possible. 
The state's expert did not identify any evidence indicating the children in a school setting would present a greater risk of transmission than some other activities the state had authorized, such as operating grocery stores, factories, daycare centers, and shopping malls. You know, one would think, one would think if you're concerned about the asymptomatic spread of disease among children, the daycare would be even worse than the school. But daycares are allowed to operate. So, you know. While the district court concluded the state's response was sufficient for rational basis, the same cannot be said for strict scrutiny. On this record, the state's concern about transmission would justify a potential range of more narrowly drawn prophylactic measures within school to mitigate risks. So, yeah, you might, as you're trying to narrowly tailor this, right, if you want to say... You want to put in some you want to put in some occupancy percentage requirements, not number requirements, but percentage. If you want to say you must mask, you must social distance, you must wash your hands, that might be okay. All right. That would be more narrowly tailored. So those prophylactic measures might be okay, but it cannot justify a wholesale closure. Thus, that brings us to the end of the discussion of the case of Matthew Brock versus Gavin Newsom, a jerk. In this case, a bunch of public school parents and a bunch of private school parents sued the governor. And the, the court in the Ninth Circuit says, in a perhaps surprising decision, because it's the Ninth Circuit, so, you know, but they say that there's no right to a public education, which is true. The school, the, the courts are very clear on that. And so you've not been deprived of anything. But if you've chosen private school and the government's saying you can't choose private school effectively because you're not allowed to go there, Right. That's interfering with a fundamental right. Right. If the school, if the state says we don't want to operate schools anymore, you don't have a right to insist. But if the private school says we want to operate schools. You have a right to insist. And it says, well, look. The Supreme Court in this case dealing with churches said these numerical caps make no sense. Why not a percentage of occupancy like you did for other businesses? Why not say 25 percent or 50 percent? Why are you saying 10 or 25 people? Where are these numbers coming from? And if you've seen some of the cathedrals in New York, you know how ridiculous that number would be, right? So this doesn't make any sense to us. And the Ninth Circuit said, well, it doesn't make any sense, to, more sense than the schools, particularly when you view them in light of these other things. And as we learned in another Court of Appeals case recently, when you're comparing like to like, you're not looking, you're looking at the interest, the like interest. So it's not quite the right comparison to say public schools versus private schools. That's a fair comparison, but it's not necessarily where it ends. You have to say when you're regulating, what is the interest you're regulating? And are you treating all things that are the same within the same band? So here the interest you're regulating is COVID, right? Which has impact everywhere, which might not necessarily be true for some interests. Some interests wouldn't have impact everywhere. So if your interest is we want to prevent people from gathering to spread the disease, rational, right? If you're going to do that, then you have to do it evenly. And when you start doing things unevenly, you have an equal protection problem. And the court doesn't go with equal protection here. They go with due process, but it's basically the same rationale. You know, there's a fundamental right of parents to have their children educated in these private institutions. And if the private institutions want to be in person, you can't simply say, close it all down, particularly when you're keeping the daycares open, you're keeping the grocery stores open, and so forth and so on. Right. The, the the reason and the rationale don't bear companionship with what you're actually doing in the real world. So they send they say this to the governor. You can't do this. You can't close the private schools altogether. So the court below will have to consider or the adult health department will have to consider perhaps more narrowly tailored regulations. But at least for the moment, that brings us to the end of the discussion of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.